This is the new Honda E, and I've brought it to London to see if I can review it by comparing the car to 10 of the Capitol's most famous landmarks. Wish me luck, because it's absolute chaos out there. Buying a new car? Head to CarWow to get offers from the UK's top dealers. CarWow.co.uk, the car buying comparison site. Before I head off on this challenge, I've actually reset the car's trip computer. I'm going to see what its energy consumption is like during this whole drive to see how far it will really go on a full charge. So I've got 97% of battery. It's saying my range is 118 miles, but we shall see. Anyway, let's head off. Just put it into drive. Ease away silently under electric power. Ah, London traffic lights immediately. <laughs> oh God, this could take a lot longer than I anticipate. It's quite early in the morning. It's only just coming up for six o'clock. Having to do it at this time because any later, we're not gonna be able to get around London because it'll just be chock-a-block with traffic. Okay, first location coming up. Can we see it? Where is it? Just a load of building work and a lot of new cycle lanes being created because of COVID. Everyone wants to cycle now. The car is not welcome in London. Not anymore. Here we go, we're arriving. <laughs> the first <laughs> location. And I don't know how close we can get to it. Let's find out. I can see the top of it. I can see the, just the top of it. Here it is. That is Battersea Power Station. And it brings me onto this car's battery. So you have a 35 kilowatt hour battery on this car. That's supposedly good for about 137 miles. So if you have the bigger wheels, the 17 inches on this car, then you only get a range of 125 miles. Now to charge it, if you can find a 50 kilowatt charger, it will charge from zero to 80% full in just 30 minutes. If you have a seven kilowatt wall box at home, it'll do it from zero to full in four hours and if you're just using a three pin plug that will take you 18 hours it's quite a long time anyway there it is look battersea power station obviously not active anymore it's being redeveloped it's going to be a shopping center anyway onwards to the next london landmark so we're coming up for the second london landmark where is it Ooh, it's just over here behind a wall <laughs> you can't see what it is yet Look through those gates, look, that's it. There it is. There'll be a couple of things that should give it away in a moment. Look through there, see those big guns? It's the Imperial War Museum. We're talking about firepower. And this car's firepower. Woo! <laughs> it's got pretty decent zip off the line. This is the range stopping version and you have a 154 horsepower motor. Drives the rear wheels, not to 60, 8.3 seconds, but that isn't the bit that matters. What matters is that sudden zip, like that, which is great for driving in town. Now you can get a lower power version that has 136 horsepower and it takes over nine seconds then to get to 60 miles an hour. One thing I like about this car is it's not just about the acceleration, it's also about the slowing. So it has a special braking mode there. That means that when I lift off the acceleration, I get some severe regenerative braking so it'll actually stop the car look i'm gonna do this and probably annoy other road users actually no there's hardly anyone here for once in london see that just lift off the accelerator and it stopped which means you can drive round just using the accelerator pedal it also means that when you're slowing you're recouping energy and putting it back in the battery to maximize your range i like that if you don't like it because you find it a little bit too extreme you can just use the normal regen braking and you can alter that by putting on the paddles like that to alter the ferocity of it and you get like a little dial there which tells you how much you've got but that's not quite severe enough for me let's go full british empire imperial war making yeah the full b mode yeah it's for me i like that the next London landmark is quite hard to get right next to, but it's actually up there. You can see it. Oh, it's gone behind that building. We'll see it in a moment when we go around the corner. It is quite easy to see it. There's a reason for that. It's the tallest building in London. Now you should be able to see it quite clearly. <laughs> there it is. It's the shard. Now that thing's all about the design. Look at it, a shard of glass. And this car is also all about the design. I love the look of this thing. I don't know about you, you can make your own mind up, but it's just so small, so cute, so unique. It really stands out, even in this sort of anonymous blue. 
prefer some of the other colors. You can get like this white, which looks like an iPad. And then there's also this really bright yellow as well, which is sort of cool. There's a gray, which is stealth. You get two-tone paint on all of them. It's a great looking thing, just the shape of it. So Honda says it's not a retro car at all. Oh no, though the shape of it is very similar to the original Civic. Also the inside, it's really nicely designed, but it does have a retro feel to me. It's a bit like someone in the 70s designed a car for the 2020s, because it's sort of 70s, this bit with the wood, which is actually fake wood. But then you've got all these screens, and I'll talk more about these screens later, but I do like the interior design. Some of the material quality in places is a bit sketch, but others, really, really nice. I love this steering wheel, the two spokes. It makes it feel nice and spacious and airy in here. Good design. Is it as good a design as the Shard? I think so for the car world. I love the little round headlights. I like the way that it's got that black panel across the grill. Obviously it's not a grill though because it's an electric car. And then at the back, the light design, I like that as well. You've got frameless windows. It's a really nice little shape. Even the way they've made a thing about the charging port on the bonnet. The wheels look cool. These 17 inches on this car, very unique. The whole car is unique. This is the kind of car that you look at and you just want it and you try and convince yourself as to why you need to buy it. It's very unlike any other Honda that's currently on sale, let's say that. Sorry, Honda, but it's true. We know it is, don't we? We're coming up to our next landmark and it's one of the most famous in all of London. Look at this. Behold the beautiful Tower Bridge. Built in 1886, it is a feat of Victorian engineering. It lifts up actually in the middle to let big ships underneath. Really funny story about it. Ages ago, some Americans bought London Bridge, paid a lot of money for it, thinking that this was London Bridge. It's actually Tower Bridge, obviously. And they ended up with London Bridge, which was just a plain old boring bridge, shipped over to them in America for quite a lot of money. That was our revenge for their independence. Fuckers. Anyway, like I say, this is all about engineering, and so is this car. Honda's engineers have squeezed a nice little electric car into this small package. It's just over four meters long, so it's very short. It's also got proper, fully independent suspension on it, so a lot of cars have quite basic rear suspension. The advantage of independent rear suspension is that it means this car is good at going over bumps, and it is pretty comfy. There is a firm edge to it to give it a little bit of a sporty feel, but it deals with bumps really well. Also, that independent rear suspension all around means that when you go on a twisty road, it actually holds on pretty blooming well. It does have a fun element to it. I've driven it on some country roads and I was impressed. I mean, it's no sports car, obviously, but it does do the job. Another thing that Honda's engineers have achieved with this car is a perfect 50-50 weight distribution. You can tell that they've been thinking that they might do a Type R version of this little EV, which would be super cool. It'd be the first electric Type R. I hope they do it. Now I'm doing what you have to do quite a lot of in London and waiting it again to the traffic lights. Hope I get round to see all the landmarks I need to. We're heading into the city of London now for the next landmark. Can you guess what it might be? That's it in there. It's quite an awesome building. Probably cost a lot. That's fine because it's got quite a bit of money. It'll be clearer what it is when I go around this corner, hopefully. Get to the front of it. Oh, chaos. Classic London chaos. <laughs> Imagine having to drive that round here. Poor bloke. Here it is. Here's the front of it. Ta-da. We have the bank of England with that one man there. Oh, he's got a mate. He's looking after all our monies. I hope they're pretty tough. So Bank of England brings me on to this car's price. It starts from just under 27,000 pounds. So it's actually more expensive than a Mini E, which is about 25 grand, a Renault Zoe, a Peugeot E208. Both of those are 26,000 pounds. An E up is just under 21,000 pounds. You do get a lot of kit with this car though, such as the panoramic roof and you've got automated cruise control with lane keeping assist and radar control so it keeps you a safe distance from the car in front you obviously get all these screens so it is well kitted out this one is the advanced model so it's about twenty nine thousand pounds and with this you get a heated steering wheel you also get this snazzy camera rear view mirror so you press this button and it flips look flips into it being a camera it's a camera now so if people are sat in the back and you can't see past their big heads flip it like that. oh god this is scary Oh, it's no fun driving around here, I tell you. 
Yeah, quite expensive. If you click on the pop-out banner up there, you can go to CarWow, where you can save an average of around £600 on one of these Honda E's, which isn't bad considering it's brand new. And of course, every little bit helps because this, I think is an overpriced car, especially when you compare that it has a lower range than all the cars that I've mentioned, which are actually cheaper. What are Honda playing at? Just over there is the River Thames. Now, I'm not having that as one of my landmarks. Reason being, I actually can't think of a link to the car. Maybe you can. It flows down a road nicely. Come up with some suggestions in the comments below. Do my job for me, because I can't do it properly. Oh, we're going to have a little bit of a battle to get into position to find the next London landmark. And this car's getting crossed. Look, hey, he's looking in. There's no solidarity, no solidarity with electric car owners. He was effing and blinding at me. Come on, I3, we're all in it together. We're electric car guys. Honestly, London. I'm surprised more people in London don't drive electric cars because they're congestion charge exempt. Otherwise, you have to pay £15 for the pleasure of driving into central London. And believe me, it is no joy at all. And so to be taxed for it as well is a double kick in the bollocks. Shall I hunker to you now? In fact, let's check out the horn. Oh, I quite like the horn. Yeah, come on, hurry up, mate. Come on, you can have some of that as well. Yeah. I hope he doesn't get out and punch me. It looked quite scary. Anyway, next London landmark is down here. And unfortunately, this guy's going the same way. I hope he doesn't stop where we stop. Oh, bugger, he really is going the same way. Getting into the theatre district here, look. We're not going there, though. We're going this way. For one of the weirdest places for driving in London. You'll see why in a moment. Covent Garden up there, where all the tourists go. Here we go, where are you? There we go, lo and behold, here it is. The famous Savoy Hotel. Now that is actually a road. That is a road, but it's a weird road because in the UK we drive on the left because of how knights used to do battle. They would have their sword and their scabbard there and then they'd pull it out like that and so they'd attack like that. So they'd pass people on the right-hand side. And then everyone else drives on the right because Napoleon didn't want to do it the same as the British because he was bitter. And um, that's why other nations drive on the right because of Napoleon. Anyway, you drive on the right when you enter that road there towards the Savoy Hotel. I've heard that the reason is because taxi drivers need to be able to pull up here outside the Savoy and open the door. Back in the old days, they'd open the door for the passengers and they'd have to do it from the driver's seat. That's why you drive down on the right. Taxis have to be able to make it quite easily round this roundabout outside the hotel. And as a result, they have to have a turning circle of around eight meters. They have it just under eight meters. This car has a turning circle of just over eight meters. So slightly more than a London taxi, which makes it not quite as maneuverable, but very, very maneuverable nonetheless. More so than pretty much any other car I've ever driven, apart from, of course, a London taxi, which I have driven. So here it is, Savoy Hotel. I can't afford to stay there, so I think we'll go out. Look, can you see out, see, see, see that on the road? And then I've got to remember to switch to the right side of the road, which is the left side of the road. The British, we're just weird. Here we are at our next London landmark. There it is, or he is, Horatio Nelson on the top of his column. So Nelson famously defeated a combined French and Spanish fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar just off the coast of Spain in 1805. He was actually outnumbered, his, his ships were outnumbered completely, but he used some really clever maneuvers to destroy the Spanish and the French. They were like floating, floating, sailing along in a straight line and he took his ships in between them like that. They couldn't bring their guns to bear on his ships, but he could actually just blow them to pieces because he could get his guns on them, but they couldn't get their guns on him because they were obviously shooting out to the side at nothing. Anyway, he decimated their fleet, won the battle. Unfortunately, he obviously got shot and to commemorate his great achievement and his death, they built that column in 1840. So. Battle of Trafalgar was all about clever manoeuvres and this car is very, very manoeuvrable. I don't know what I did there. So the steering is very sharp, it's accurate. Sometimes in electric cars, you don't feel like the front wheels are really connected to the steering wheel, but with this one, you really do. And it helps you when zipping in and out of traffic. Also, the visibility is good. So the dash is quite low and you sit sort of high-ish, a bit higher than you probably do in a normal hatchback. Not like an SUV, obviously, but that does give you a good view out and there's lots of glass and that roof does help let light in as well so you can see exactly what's going on 
God, <laughs> I don't know how many traffic lights I've come to today. Oh, just there, while we're here, may as well talk about it. Look, there's the National Gallery as well. And then there's some kind of modern art there. Can you see that one there? It's like some kind of ice cream with a cherry on top and a drone stuck in it. That's where they have some kind of like freaky modern stuff to balance out the like statues and stuff. I could be a London tour guide, couldn't I? Although not many people would fit in here. And that brings me on to my next London landmark. We're heading out onto a red road which leads to it. And this road is called the Mall. And at the end is a big old house. It's Buckingham Palace. It's where Betty lives. In case you're not British, Betty is short for Elizabeth. So that's where Queen Elizabeth II lives. Our Queen. Oh, she's in, the flag's up. If the Union Jack is flying above Buckingham Palace, it means the Queen is in residence. We're gonna pop by and say hello, see what she thinks of this car. We're quite close, me and Betty. Anyway, Buckingham Palace, very, very spacious. So let's talk about this car's interior space, shall we? Because it's certainly not palatial. It's actually all right here in the front because of the way it's designed. It's quite roomy because you don't really have anything separating you or the front passenger. There's no gear selector. But in the back, it's a right old squeeze and you can only actually fit two people in the back. You've only got seat belts for two. The problem with the rear seats isn't the headroom. It's actually quite good. However, knee room is tight, especially for people over six foot. And then there's the fact that with the batteries underneath the floor, your knees end up quite high up and there's very little under thigh support so it's not that comfy in the back for long journeys then there's the boot which is tiny 170 liters it's smaller than the minis it's a lot smaller than a peugeot e208 it's almost useless you can only fit two small airplane style carry-on luggage cases in the boot if you need more boot space and you don't have any rear passengers you can fold down the back seat though they just fold down as one unit which is annoying if you want to carry three people and some extra stuff. Why don't they have split folding rear seats? I want to like this car. I do really want to like it, but I'm not sure how I could fully live with it. The door bins are pretty awful as well. I can just about look, I can fit that bottle in with a squeeze. That's why it's all crushed. It's not great. You do have a little extra cup holder here and I like that design. And there's a pouch down there as well where you can put your mobile phone. And you've got all your USBs and your connectors down here as well. There's some dividers here where you can put stuff. So that is quite useful. But other than that, for passengers, <laughs> rubbish and utterly terrible for their luggage as well. I'd rather be in there, that's for sure. Quite frankly, much more me. Listen, I'm a boy from Warsaw and I live in a blooming two bedroom flat at the moment. <laughs> so actually the, the Honda E is quite familiar. <laughs> right, we are coming up to our next landmark. And it's all about this. Look, it's Piccadilly Circus. And we're here because of those screens. It's famous for having these huge TV screens. And obviously that brings me on to the technology in this car with its huge screens. So you've got a big screen there for the passenger, another one there for the central infotainment system, digital driver's display, and then we've got the two cameras either side there. I'll talk about these first. You don't have wing mirrors on this car. You have little cameras and they just poke out a little bit and they're actually not wider than the wheel arch on the car, so they're actually slightly inboard, and they give you a clear view of what's down the side of your car. Now, I've tried digital side view mirror things on an Audi e-tron, and they just don't work because the screen's down there, whereas here, they are in the right place. I've got used to them pretty blooming quickly, and they do let you know what's in your blind spot. Actually better than a mirror, I think, now, one of the problems you might think that if you've got these cameras, if it's raining, they're going to get covered in water. But the design of them and the fact they're covered in a special water repellent coating means that they don't get covered in water. So you always get a clear view in the mirrors. It's fine. What's not so fine is the infotainment system. So some of the menus are a little bit confusing, but it's not that bad. You've got big icons to use. The problem for me is the fact that the graphics are a little bit washed out it's not the sharpest screen i wish they had done a bit more with it spent a bit extra to make sure the screens are super sharp it's a shame because it's such a centerpiece of the car itself they cheaped out a little bit on it it's not the most responsive either uh, it's a little bit slow at times come on come on come on now come on i want to see android auto again yeah come on that's it wake up and that's a bit frustrating it's not awful you can use it and you're going to run your Apple CarPlay or Android Auto through it anyway, so you don't have to mess about with Honda system, which is not the best, to be honest. But it is let down a little bit by it's not quite as high tech 
as the car really deserves and it really does deserve at this kind of price and we're getting honked pretty badly because we've got white van man is not happy here we go check this guy out here to the right he's annoyed look at this guy he's annoyed i thought they'd be cool i thought they'd like forgive this little car because it's so cute but nope <laughs> Right, we're driving towards our final landmark. And as we do, we shall pass another landmark, which I'm not including. Driving down a place called Whitehall. Down there is Downing Street, hence all the security. That's where the Prime Minister, Mr. Boris Johnson lives. Here is the Cenotaph, which remembers all those who have died in various wars around the world. And on the 11th of November, the Queen will lay a reef there. Anyway, here's the final landmark. It's the Palace of Westminster, also known as the Houses of Parliament. It's been refurbished at the moment at huge cost, but that is the home of British politics. And that brings me on to the politics surrounding this car. Electric cars, the government are pushing them. So you get a £3,000 government grant to buy one in the UK, which does help. And there's obviously various tax breaks if you have one as a company car. You get parking in London for free in certain cases. You can get into the congestion charge free of charge. They're pushing people into electric cars. However, they're not fully supporting the infrastructure. Really, unless you have a Tesla, it's a little bit harder to find charging places. Tesla, with its supercharger network, is second to none. Then there's the whole fact about what actual range you get out of these cars. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I started my trip computer. I've done 20 miles and it's averaged four miles per kilowatt, which is actually all right. I've been driving around town and if I did the maths, four miles per kilowatt, this has a 35.5 kilowatt hour battery. That means it has a range of about 140 miles. But like I said, just driving around town. You see, if you want to drive longer on the motorway, you're probably not going to get that kind of range out of it. It will be a lot less. Electric cars are a lot more efficient in town. Now, Honda does build this car as an urban car for use in town. But let's be honest, if you're spending £29,000 on a car, you are going to be able to want to use it for longer journeys, even though the maker may say, oh no, actually, it's just an urban car. You've got to consider that. And really, when it comes to range, this is one of the poorest electric cars for how far you can travel on a full charge. And that, for me, is a big problem with a Honda E. I do love it. I like the look of it. I think it's cool. I think it's quirky. I think it's got personality. And personality does go a long way. But unfortunately, this car doesn't go a long way. And that brings me on to five annoying things about the Honda E. The back windows only go down this far, which is terrible. And then when you load them and you open the door, you're left with this spike and it can be like, Lynn, I've pierced my face on a spike. Lynn, I've pierced my foot on a spike. If you've got long legs, there's a good chance that you're gonna end up knocking the heated seat on by mistake. And it's really annoying in summer because you're driving along and then you're like, why is my arse so sweaty? The camera for that switchable rear view mirror is actually just there. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any of the raindrop repelling properties as the door camera mirrors. So if it's torrential, it becomes pretty much useless. Honda says they decided not to give this car a really long range because they didn't want to fit too many batteries to it because that would add weight, which makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is that this car is heavier than a Mini Electric and a Peugeot E208, and those cars both have longer ranges. So what's that all about? One of the great things about electric cars, especially those with motors in the back, is that they should have some storage space underneath the bonnet, because there's no engine there, obviously. So, the Honda E, but doesn't have any space. In fact, what is all this stuff? It's not all negative, though. Here's five good things about this car. You might be wondering where this car's aerial is for the radio and the GPS. It doesn't even have one of those little shark fin aerials on the roof. That's because the antenna and the GPS module is actually integrated into this pillar here. So the design is kept nice and clean. There's some real cool little interesting features in this car. They're very Japanese. Obviously this picture you get here is of a Japanese garden, but check this out. If I press this button, I can turn the screens into an aquarium. Look, and I can dab like that to feed the fish. I can also mess around to change the size of the fish and the backgrounds. So let's go for something a bit more interesting. Wait for it to load in. And there we go. Let's feed those fish. Just wish I could make the fish eat each other. Wish I could add a shark, but you can't. Still, it's cool. 
You can get a special digital key for your mobile phone, so it'll automatically lock and unlock the car when you get near it, allow you to start it, and it connects your phone to the car seamlessly, so you don't have to be messing around with wires, and then you're just good to go. As well as the usual USB input and a 12 volt socket, you've also got a three pin socket with 230 volts and 1500 watt capacity so you can charge your laptop off there or even run a games console. Speaking of which, you can plug that games console into this HDMI port and then play the games on the car's screens. Honda's really gone all out on this car's design, look. So, poppy outy door handles, I'm liking that. I also like the fact that they hide the rear door handles because this may look like a three door, but it's actually five door only. And how about this? We've got bronze seat belts. Or is that just brown? I don't care, I like them. So then what's my final verdict on the new Honda E? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should consider the Honda E it's really cool, it's cute, it's nice to drive, and it does something a little bit different to any other car. The only problem is, it's flawed. It's expensive, the range isn't great, and it's not the most practical. Oh dear. Still love it though. I love you, Honda, I do. I do. You've got personality, and that's what matters. There's Sir Winston Churchill's statue. I don't need to explain who he is, surely. Hey Google. What's the statue at Piccadilly Circus? Showing results for what's the statue at Piccadilly Circus along your route. Hello. Do you like my car? I do. Do you like mine? I've got one of those. It's a bit dirty. It's a bit dirty. <laughs> for the environment. This is electric. It's quite typical of London. You speak to an Italian guy in a German car in a British city.